Hey, good day, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is Karen Walsh, National Event Director of the Financial Executives Alliance. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Finders Exemptions, Summer Enforcement Initiatives, and Capital Raising, What's Happening with Investment Management and Private Funds. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the FEA website for future reference. The FEA is a complimentary networking association intended for senior financial executives of alternative investment firms. If you are not yet a member of the FEA, please take a moment to register on our website, www.feaai.com, or you can reach out to me directly. The phone lines will remain on mute, so if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box, and our presenters will answer them during the presentation. A follow-up note will include contact information, as well as the deck, and will be sent out post-event for your convenience. Please note that I've included a document link to the SEC finders exemption to the chat for your reference. Um, we have a lot of information to cover today, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce Greg Nowak, partner of Troutman Pepper, to kick us off and introduce our special guest. Greg? Well, thank you very much, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gregory Novak. I'm a partner at Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders, uh, affectionately known as Troutman Pepper. And um, welcome to our program today, which is somewhat of a update on all of the enforcement actions and other information that uh, we have gotten from the regulators in the asset management space, in particular, the SEC, the CFTC, um, and also some very recent developments, the recent proposal from the SEC to allow finders. And we're going to talk about that as well. Um, plus, we're also going to talk about raising capital in a pandemic. Uh, given the fact that most of us are working remotely, given this event today as an example, um, it, it's very difficult to raise capital the way we used to, walking into a potential investor, shaking their hand, having them come to our offices to do due diligence. And so to talk about um, the difficulties and what some strategies people are using, I have with me Evan Katz. Uh, Evan, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, Karen. Thanks, Greg. Sure. Uh, my name is Evan Katz. I'm Managing Director at Crawford Ventures, headquartered uh, in New York City, uh, where we specialize in uh, hedge funds and alternative investments and uh, fundraising uh, included in that. And uh, thanks to the FEA and uh, to Greg and Karen for having me today. And thank you for joining us, Kevin. Uh, Kevin, Evan, excuse me. <laughs> um, all right, well, without further ado, we're gonna move right into our slide material. Certainly, if you have a question, as Karen said, please uh, use the question function and send it, and we will try to address them along the way as opposed to waiting into the end. We do have a hard stop of one hour, so, and a lot of material to cover, so we are going to start moving. So here's our agenda today. I already gave you a quick overview of that. No reason to read the slide. So let's talk about the finder's exemption. Um, this was announced on October 7th, about a week ago, by the chairman of the SEC, Jay Clayton. And basically what he said was that uh, after almost 30 years of proposals being considered from various industry groups, from individuals, from issuers, the SEC staff finally said, you know what, we should uh, memorialize some of the exceptions that are out there and create a few new ones in order to allow finders to find capital for companies that need it. Now, the proposal is directed for the most part to individual issuing companies, operating companies, not necessarily funds, although there is nothing in the proposal that suggests that funds would be excluded from being able to take advantage of it. The proposal is still a proposal, so before you go out and burn your uh, brokerage sponsorship agreement with a broker dealer or otherwise think that you can engage in some of these activities, remember it is a proposal and you cannot rely on it yet. You must still work within the confines of current law. So that's the biggest takeaway. But the contours of the proposal are as follows. There's two tiers of finders. Tier one is effectively a Paul Anka no action letter finder. This is someone who, um, identifies a particular investment opportunity and simply passes on the names and contact information of that person's friends, very similar to what Paul Anka did 40 years ago, to the issuer. 
And the issuer contacts the people, the issuer deals with the due diligence, the issuer completes the sale. And if there's a completed sale, then they pay that finder a fee. Now, the important thing to keep in mind about the tier one finders, I call them the, the uh, golf course foursome finders, is that it has to be a casual thing and you can only do it once a year. And you still need a written agreement with the issuer. So this is not something that is uh, to be taken lightly. And certainly, given its current contours, is very similar to the Paul Anka no action letter that has been with us for 40 years. It does not open the door more than a crack for purposes of these types of finders. Tier 2 finders, on the other hand, can do a lot more. They are much more like private placement brokers, uh, they can be involved more in the transaction process, they can deliver information, um, and they can receive transaction-based compensation. But they too can only do this if they have a written agreement with the issuer. And there are other constraints that are applicable to the tier two finders. Probably the most important one is if you have a series seven or a series 79 or uh, another um, associated person license with a registered broker dealer, you cannot be a finder. And why? Because the SEC and FINRA still want you to be under the supervision and control of your sponsoring broker dealer. Now, Evan, I know you are a registered representative of a broker dealer. And I know the reason you are is because you are a compliant person and want to make sure that in your activities as a private placement person, um, everything is legal and up to snuff. What are your thoughts about the proposal that has come out of the SEC with respect to finders? Well, Greg, uh, having sort of tracked this issue for more than a decade uh, in the alternative space and as fundraisers, we were kind of surprised that there was really any movement towards less regulation rather than more. Uh, maybe it's the current administration, uh, but uh, we were kind of surprised by it. I think like the JOBS Act, it certainly was probably enacted more with a view towards companies. You know, the JOBS Act is the 506C general solicitation fundraise provision that came out about five or six years ago. Uh, and in that case, famously, uh, it was pretty much intended for companies and the SEC was kind of dragged kicking and screaming into allowing it for hedge funds because that's what Congress enacted. Uh, plain and simple on the face of it. So we were surprised to see the SEC sort of on its own uh, come out with these proposals. And I mean, on a personal level, I think I'm I'm sort of fine with it. It lets people uh, do sort of casually one-off introductions, uh, which people have been doing for years anyway, without violating uh, securities laws. I mean, obviously for any company or fund who's looking to do substantial fundraising, you're going to probably end up going with some professional organization, internal or external, where they do this for a living uh, as a registered rep at a broker dealer and have been raising a ton of money for decades. But, you know, personally, I guess I'm in favor of it because it does allow somebody to help somebody else out where if they can make an introduction or two, you know, they can get paid for it, you know, sort of broker dealer light. And there are some restrictions in there, as you said, where they cannot take custody of assets and other protections. So this should not be um, opening up Pandora's uh, should not be op opening up a Pandora's box. They cannot take possession of uh, of cash, for example. Uh, well, the investors have to be accredited. So it seems to be a good compromise between, uh, on the one hand, allowing capital formation and people to help uh, companies and funds raise money, without increasing too much uh, any risk of fraud or theft. Yeah. Very good point that the limitations in the proposal, which are outlined in the alert that's um, referenced in the slide at the bottom here, but it's also appended, uh, Karen, I believe, to the materials, uh, outlines these limitations. And let me just highlight two of them. One, um, in both cases, the tier one and the tier two, the finder has to have a written agreement with the issuer. And so that takes out of the uh, realm of the casual uh, finder. And then secondly, the finder has to have a reasonable belief that the person they're quote unquote finding is an accredited investor. Now, unlike a Jobs Act offering where you can solicit anyone 
in a general solicitation, and then the gate is set up that they have to be accredited when, in fact, they make the investment with the issuer. In this case, before you solicit them, before you go to the potential investor, the finder is supposed to have a reasonable belief that the person is an accredited investor. And the adopting release goes on um, to suggest that the traditional means by which people by which people establish that someone is a quote unquote accredited investor is what is supposed to be done here. Now, generally, the whole point of the accredited investor test is that the uh, person who's doing the soliciting believes that the investor has the assets so that if the investment goes to zero, their lifestyle won't change. That's sort of a rule of thumb capital formation view. So, again, if the proposal is adopted in its current form, its utility is very limited. And then I guess the third important point is that state law still continues to apply. So if you're in a state like New York, where you must have a written agreement in order to enforce a uh, commission or a share or a transaction-based compensation, you still need that written agreement. And if you're in certain states that still have rescission remedies, if the person is not a licensed finder in that state or with the SEC and, and FINRA, well, then those rules are still going to apply. So remember, we are in a federal system. The federal law is an overlay over the state law and only supersedes state law where it's intended to supersede. In this case, it does not. And so you still have to look out for state law. So. Um, again, this is a shot across the bow. This rule has been proposed. We have no idea if and when it would be adopted, especially with an election in a few weeks. Uh, generally, the SEC does not try to adopt legis uh, new rules during the period of time between the election and when the new administration uh, takes over in January. But who knows? Uh, at this point, I think that we're probably looking at early January for any action by the staff but more time will tell. So let's move on. Recent Greg, actions by the- Sorry. Yes. Sorry, Greg, Greg, one Greg. question came in on that subject. Um, can the written Greg. agreement happen after a referral? Not after the referral, no. It can happen at the same time because you need an acknowledgement by the investor that they are aware that you're acting as a finder and that the, the, um, the investor knows what the compensation arrangements are. So no. Uh, it would have to happen simultaneously with the investment at the at the latest. And Greg, one question too on this. Uh, I guess a quick point and a quick question. This also brings into parity to some degree what used to be a crazy situation where a person could refer an investor to say a hedge fund, for example, that's running a separately managed account because the person was referring the investor to someone who'd be receiving investment advice on the running of their separately managed account, and that was okay, but the person could not refer the same investor to the same firm running the same strategy as a hedge fund, because that would be the sale of a security. In other words, and this can make lawyers' heads spin, much less lay people, you had a situation before this proposal where, I, where someone could refer someone to an RIA to manage the money but not to a hedge fund because that's a sale of security. Is, is that correct? And this would bring it into somewhat parity? Well, I don't know if it would bring it into parity, uh, but you are absolutely correct. There is a distinct difference in the law between the sale of a, of a product, namely the sale of a security, an interest in a fund, versus the sale of a service, and that's the sale of investment advisory services. So. The, the classic um, conundrum that you identify is very real, and that is uh, someone is out there saying, would you like to you know, earn 10% a year on your money? Well, if you invest in, with Mr. Smith, who's a great money manager, you'll get 10% a year. At least that's what the past return is. Of course, past returns are not indicative of future success. And, the per and you go to Mr. Smith and Mr. Smith says, well, you know what, that is too small of an account. I don't manage separately managed accounts at that size, but I would take it into the hedge fund. And so if that person who acted as a third party solicitor 
for the advisor services um, followed the rules for third party cash solicitation under the Advisors Act and had an agreement in place with the with the client and did all the appropriate disclosures, they could have gotten paid. But as soon as it flips from the advisor service into an investment in a fund where it's the sale of a security, then unless that person is in fact licensed, they cannot receive transaction based compensation for the sale of a security. You're correct. This rule in certain circumstances may harmonize those, but the SEC went to pains in one of the footnotes, I forget the number, in the adopting release to say this is not the same as the third party solicitation rule under the Advisors Act. They serve different purposes. And while they look similar, they're not the same. And you, you need essentially two arrangements in place one to sell services and one to sell the product. At least it's getting closer where before one was possible and one was impossible. At least it's getting closer now. I Yeah, that's that's a good way to describe it. That's a good way to describe it. But again, nothing has happened. This is just a proposal. So we're still stuck with the current conundrum. And one, one um, quick question. Is this binding on the Department of Justice on individual people? In other words, if the SEC passes this proposal, does that preclude the DOJ from bringing an action? Does it preclude a private person from asking for rescission? Uh, saying it was unlawful, even though the SEC has this policy, or does anyone even know? Well, it's not a policy. If it's adopted by the commission, this is an exemptive order. Essentially, the Congress gave the SEC the authority to exempt certain types of transactions or people or arrangements from the application of the federal securities laws. And this would be an exemptive order that would relieve the finder and the issuer from the rule under Section 15B of the 34 Act that says that um, a transaction with an illegal finder is void, right? That's the rescission remedy that you were referencing. So yes, this would take away the federal sword of Damocles. It does not relieve a um, the individuals or the company from state law requirements. So you would still need to worry about um, whether or not, for example, you've complied with the New York statute of frauds for purposes of the uh, registration requirements. Okay, next slide. The recent actions by the SEC and FINRA during the summer covered crypto, merchant cash advance, certain advisor spawn, uh, cross trades, and then uh, FINRA has issued some clarification with respect to sponsoring broker dealer arrangements. The ICO cases and the MCA cases sort of have similar themes. Um, in almost every case, the tokens or coins were determined to be securities by the SEC using the Howey test. And then from there, you have the, the normal uh, log of nasty things happening. The issuers didn't register the tokens with the SEC, uh, with the SEC under the 33 Act. They didn't even try to fit within the Reg D, Reg A, or 506 C exemptions. They allowed immediate trading in the secondary market and they provided no disclosure to investors. And on top of that, many of them were scams. So if you ask yourself, okay, how does this differ from a blank check SPAC where you're both raising risk capital? Um, in the latter, the difference is it's a registered offering. They filed with the SEC, they've disclosed and disclosed and disclosed. And then the money raised is actually safeguarded in real custody accounts to avoid the scam. So I think um, the, the SPAC shows a well-trod path to how to raise risk capital um, versus the tokens and ICOs that have all been falling squarely in the sights of the regulators. So just so everyone is clear, ICO means initial coin offering. They're also referred to as tokens. MCAs refer to merchant cash advances. Uh, participations, these are contractual interest, and is it a security? Well, it depends. It depends on how it's structured, who the issuer is, if there's another regulatory arrangement in place. And then the last, what is the security? Well, that's the familiar Howey test and Rivas test. Howey, I'm sure everyone knows, referred to a sale of participation interest in orange groves in Florida. And people would come to the hotel, they get a high pressure sales um, pitch to buy an interest in an orange grove. And then they were wholly reliant on the orange grove manager to manage the groves, harvest the oranges, squeeze them, and then sell the orange juice. 
And the uh, Supreme Court determined that because there was an investment of money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profit, reliant on the efforts of others, that that was an investment contract. And an investment contract is, in fact, a security. Several years later, the Supreme Court got this issue back again in the Reeves case. And there we had a question of whether or not a loan was a security. Now, if you look at a loan versus a debenture versus a bond, in, in every case, they, it is a um, extension of credit with a promise to pay a sum certain at some time in the future. But then the question is, does that mean every debt security subject to regulation under the federal securities laws? And I think the Supreme Court would worry of the fact that that never was Congress's intent. And so they did the so-called family resemblance test. Does the loan in place look like something that the industry would consider to be a security. And so it's kind of a, you know, and this is a highly technical legal term, squishy test, but nevertheless, it's something that we have all learned to live with because it, the only thing that's out there that de defines the difference between a note being a security and a note not being a security. So let's go, we just talked about how we, Let's talk about some of the recent uh, enforcement actions and complaints that we've seen come out of the SEC. The Hoods Zack matter, um, the SEC um, alleged that this was a fraudulent raise and a misappropriation of money in a fund. They misrepresented past performance and assets. They provided investors with false financial statements and forged an audit report. I got to tell you, if you're forging an audit report, you've probably done something wrong. And that's a pretty good indication that this was a scam. And as soon as the auditor says, I never did that, I never prepared that report, that was a pretty clear indication that um, they were going to come down full weight on these issuers. The dollars were dissipated into personal digital asset accounts of the two promoters. So that's a pretty uh, clear case. We have a scam, uh, unregistered securities, and misappropriation of money. A little later, the Telegram group was forced to return more than $1.2 billion to investors and then paid an $18.5 million penalty. The conclusion was that the grams being issued by the Telegram group, so-called coins or tokens, were unregistered securities. Now, Graham did not admit or uh, deny the allegations, but they did consent to the disgorgement and the penalty and an injunction. And they have to give notice to the SEC before participating in the issuance of digital assets for three years, effectively ending the viability of that particular company. August of 2020, Boon Tech. This was an SEC enforcement action, respect you know, $5 million of so called Boon coins. They sold the Boon coins to more than 1,500 investors in the US and worldwide. And the purpose was to develop and market a platform to connect employers posting jobs with freelancers seeking work. So this was a risk capital raise. Sounds like Howie. They represented that the boot coins were using a patent pending technology to hedge boon coins against the US dollar, but no such technology existed. The remedy was discouragement, a prejudgment interest payment, and the destruction of all boon coins and an issuance to all third party platforms to start trading boon coins. The promoter was publicized $150,000 and barred from serving as an officer or a director of a public company. Again, um, these were consented to enforcement actions, but it does indicate the way the SEC looks at these things. Now, Evan, I know in a prior life, you were an intellectual um, property lawyer. What exactly does, when somebody says they have patent pending, what exactly does that mean? Does that have any significance at all? Well, Greg, that's a great question. Yes, I am, as they say in the trade, a recovering lawyer. Uh, it's one of the five licenses I have, uh, still have it. And you raise a great point. What in the world is patent pending? Uh, first, I, I think it was a cartoon character called patent pending. But aside from that, it really has absolutely no meaning at all. So uh, if I stick a piece of paper in the patent and trademark office seeking a patent, you know, can I run around saying I've got patent pending technology? It's really a very misleading term because it really has no meaning at all. I mean, theoretically, I could stick a blank piece of paper in the patent and trademark office and maybe make the same claim. So as you were discussing with folks who forge uh, 
reports, uh, accounting audits, and cases like this, it seems like the people involved in this were really trying to take every edge to mislead investors because the only time one should really say that you have patent pending technology is first of all, if you have the technology, here they didn't. So uh, if you don't have technology, it can't be patent pending technology. But the only time you should really use the expression is if you filed an application with the Patent and Trademark Office for a patent, they've allowed your application and you've got a date certain that it's gonna be issued. So they allow your application on October 15th, 2020, and you have a good reason to believe that that patent's gonna issue in four to six weeks, then it's probably fair to say it's patent uh, pending because it's been examined and it's been allowed. But in this case, there was no technology and probably really no examination of that. Yeah, and the other important thing to keep in mind is after the Supreme Court decision in the Alice case a few years ago, it's a little more difficult than it ever was to get a patent with respect to financial services and processes. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult than simply saying, hey, I use a computer to compute, to compute NAV. Um, when someone suggests that they have a patent pending technology to hedge, well, that sounds like an investment process to me. And, you know, I think at a minimum, investors need to understand they have to dig a little bit deeper uh, and say, what exactly is that technology? How does it work? And if, in fact, it's patent pending, that means there should be artwork, right, Evan, filed in the Patent and Trademark Office. The whole point of a patent is that the world now sees exactly what you are doing and should be able to understand it. So the notion that this is proprietary information really should not apply. And, and again, that's sort of a word to the wise here. If someone suggests they have this uh, and then they're trying to do, use also trade secret. Those two are mutually ex exclusive. You can't patent Coke and at the same time maintain that the formula for Coke is secret. That's yeah, Greg, not the you, way patents work. Yeah, you're 100% correct. And there's always the tension whether you want to file a patent application or try to keep a trade secret. So if a company is making physical products, widgets, electronics, drugs, pharmaceuticals, they almost always, not always, but almost always take the patent route because then they get exclusive rights for a certain period of time. But as you said, they do have to disclose to the industry and to the world what they are doing. But in exchange for that, you get a monopoly for a limited period of time. However, you can always see in the real world, if your patents are being infringed, if another company is using your technology, it's usually pretty, you can usually determine that. And most companies typically don't willfully infringe, although some certainly do. Uh, if you're a financial services firm, in contrast, and you've got the greatest trading strategy of all time, uh, what we see is the opposite of that. You never want to disclose that. You want to keep that as a trade secret. Uh, you don't want to file a patent for it for a couple of reasons, one of which is you've got to disclose it to the world. And if I disclose my greatest trading strategy to the world, how in the, in the world can you tell if you're using it or Karen's using it or some other company's using it? because I don't see what you're trading as opposed to a widget or a manufacturing company where I can see your product or your drug or pharmaceutical and oftentimes have a better chance of figuring it out. So yeah, for most, most hedge funds, if they've got a great secret sauce, they're keeping it a trade secret. They're never filing patent applications on it. So again, a good due diligence point for our audience. Okay, Unicorn. Unicorn was the operator of an esports gaming and gambling platform. They raised $31 million in an offering of their Unicoin gold tokens, or the UKGs. The SEC held that Unicorn had sold investment contracts and failed to register them. The remedy, they had to return all the money and pay a $6.1 million penalty, representing virtually all of Unicorn's assets. Now, the interesting point about this uh, enforcement action is it actually prompted a rare dissent by one of the commissioners, Dr. Pierce, affectionately known as the crypto mob in the industry, she dissented and said that this action stifled innovation. Where there's no allegation of fraud and just an allegation of failure to comply with registration requirements, in her view, a different remedy should be appropriate because the net effect of the $6.1 million penalty and the disgorgement and the return of all the money was that unicorn gold was or unicorn rather, was put out of business they had no other capital to operate now um whether commissioner pierce is right that there should be an intermediate remedy is uh, she's obviously the sec commissioner but the majority disagreed and said no our registration requirements are intended to protect investors and the failure to register 
means that you violated the law and had no right to the money. This is a classic securities law remedy, return all the money. And so while I can understand Commissioner Pierce's um, suggestion that this will stifle innovation, I don't think that a failure to comply with registration requirements is a minimal requirement. It is throughout all of these instances, it, it, it's a corner cut. And if the issuers had simply asked themselves the question, okay, what if my determination that this coin is a utility token is wrong? What happens? Well, it would be an investment contract. Okay, how do I protect myself? Well, you fit it under Reg D or Reg A or one of the other requirements. And in terms of secondary market trading, you restrict secondary market trading for six months. In most of these instances, it's going to take six months or more for the platform or the ecosystem to be developed and actually begin operating. And so it doesn't make any sense why you want to immediately take the token and put it onto the secondary market unless you're trying to do an end run and a scam. And so, again, one way to have done this, it seems to me, would have been to do a Reg D offering. You're not offering a fund, so you don't have to worry about um, 100 person limitations. It's an operating company. You can raise an unlimited amount of money from accredited investors under Regulation D. And then once this, the restrictions under the 33 Act lapse, the, the instruments can be traded over the counter. So there is a way forward if people had simply thought it through and decided that, you know, maybe we should follow a different rule, or as I've said to many clients, embrace regulation. Uh, because if you embrace regulation, what more can the regulator ask for? And it's likely that you're not going to be stuck in this rescission circumstance. Uh, SEC versus CAN Capital. This is an MCA case. CAN had raised $191 million from investors through the securitization of a revolving pool of MCAs and business loans. So these are merchant cash advances. Remember, a merchant cash advance is not a loan. It's actually a forward purchase of future receivables. If anything, it's more like a futures contract than a security. And um, the SEC always seems to miss this point. And it is a very important distinction between loans and MCAs. MCAs are not loans. There's no some certain, there's no obligation to repay over a specific period of time, and there's no payment for the use and forbearance of money. It's no different than a factor who buys uh, existing receivables and says, the face amount of those receivables is $100,000, I'll give you $60,000 for them. You as the merchant can choose to sell those receivables or not. If you sold, sell them, that's the end of the road with respect to you and those receivables. It's the factor that has to go through the process of collecting on them. In a merchant cash advance contract, the receivables don't, agree, uh, don't exist yet. Think of a restaurant that needs $10,000 to buy food stuff in order to make dinners for the next week. The receivables don't exist yet from the, uh, the, pay, um, the clients who come in and, and buy food. So what you as a merchant cash advance company are doing is saying, when those receivables are created, they belong to me. It's like buying October oil. So if you're used to futures trading in the futures market, MCAs make a lot of sense. If not, then you fall into traps, which to be perfectly blunt, it seems as if some regulators regularly fall into of treating these as if they're loans when they're not. Having said that, the issue here was that they were taking these assets and securitizing them. As soon as you securitize any asset, you've created a security. You know, the whole notion of securitization, it's a security. And once you do that, you have to worry about all of the issues associated with that new thing you've just created. Here, CAN had granted forbearance to merchants, and the grace period for this forbearance was inconsistent with the disclosure to the investors in the securitization. The result was that the use of the non-disclosed grace period, the securitizations were failing to meet their certain credit enhancement requirements that were designed to limit investor risk in the securitization. And as a result, the mezzanine investors, the Class B investors, incurred losses. The remedy here was an injunction consented to by CAN that they could not use this 
uh, forbearance period. Those of you who've been involved in CLOs or you know, back before the financial crisis in 2008, CDOs know that in a securitization transaction, everything is designed to make sure the cash flows follow the indenture. The indentures are three, 400 pages long. The disclosures are three, 400 pages long. And it lays out fairly carefully the protections that are put in place to make sure the cash flows move in the right direction. If, for example, the underlying grist for the mill, the MCAs or loans become non-performing and they exceed a certain agreed upon grace period, then what's supposed to happen is the cash flow that comes in is supposed to be used to pay down the more senior investors because that's their deal. That was the credit enhancement that we were talking about in this securitization. By changing the rules after the securitization is put in place and granting longer forbearance to the merchants, in effect, creating risk for those mezzanine lenders that they will not be paid. Most securitizations are duration plays, and the longer that they last, the greater the likelihood that the lower class investors in the securitization will be paid, and then ultimately the equity holders will receive a very significant return. So uh, the longer the time they exist, the better. The shorter the time, the more protection to the higher rated of those securities in the securitization. All right, next slide is um, SEC versus Complete Business Solutions. Now, this is an ongoing litigation. It's, it, it is against uh, PAR funding, which is a DBA of Complete Business Solutions. The allegations are that they used a network of unregistered sales agents and affiliated entities to sell promissory notes to the public. Then they were also using agents to raise money in funds using prepackaged private funds and then funneling that money to PAR funding. PAR funding was a merchant cash advance and other business lender. And there was also an issue about misleading investors about the nature of the business, how the investment funds were used and also the fact that one of the promoters had a criminal history that apparently was not closed. So this is still an unfolding case, but it raises all of the traditional issues. Disclosure, disclosure about all of the nasty things that may be about your, uh, your personnel involved. Um, if you are using someone who has a criminal history, how you are protecting the investor's funds and the processes of the business from misappropriation or anything else. Uh, obviously, recidivism is not something that can be presumed in a criminal court, but it is something that you wanna disclose in order to avoid the opportunity for recidivism, at least in the minds of the investors. So this is still working through with its way through the courts and who knows what ultimately is going to happen. There is a bankruptcy trustee appointed who's trying to recover funds for the investors Stay tuned. Advisor cross trades. Um, this is one of those where investors um, are probably completely blithely ignorant of what's happening with their managers, but there are rules against managers selling an asset from one customer account and putting it into another because they're afraid of propping up. Palmer Square arranged cross trades among registered and private funds that it managed 351 times between July of 2014 and September of 2016. The purchasing side always paid a markup and the registered funds violated statutory provisions on cross trading without complying with exempt rule 17A7. They tried to dress it up by interposing a broker. Section 48 of the Investment Company Act says that doesn't help. You can't do indirectly what you can't do directly. The advisor violated rules there are sections 2063 and 2064 of the Advisors Act. It was a cease and desist, censure, and penalty. 2063 and 2064, these are oldies but goodies. They are in the Advisors Act. They apply to advisors, even if you're not registered. And they prohibit transactions between accounts that an advisor manages in which they have a stake as manager or where they're acting as a broker between the two. And I'm, talk, I'm not talking about a FINRA registered broker. I'm simply saying where the advisor is brokering a transaction between two accounts that it manages. 
you have to disclose beforehand, you have to get the consent of both clients, it has to be in writing. And you have to disclose all the fees, you know, this uh, purchasing site always paid a markup. Uh, you have to disclose the fees that are being paid in the transaction. The problem with private funds is who can consent on behalf of the private fund. The general partner presumably owns or is affiliated with the manager and so forth. So therefore the general manager, the general partner is precluded from being able to consent on behalf of the investors. This is where you need an LPAC or as we've seen some new recent funds innovating the use of a board of directors that is being adopted by the private fund as a means of avoiding these issues. So then we have uh, a FINRA National Adjudicatory Council enforcement decision uh, on June 29th, 2020 against Silverleaf Partners. Basically, the upshot of this case was that if you are a registered rep of a broker dealer, and I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but here's the broker dealer, and you have commissions and client fees coming into the broker dealer, those commissions have to be paid to the registered rep. They cannot be paid to the registered rep's limited liability company. That is considered a violation of the uh, Securities Exchange Act of 1934. And the registered rep cannot split those fees with a finder or someone who is unlicensed. So this is the way the fees have to be paid. And then a 1099 has to be issued by the broker to the registered rep. Here we had fines assessed against the uh, for violations of various NASD and FINRA rules, as well as failure to supervise and costs. Now, this matter has been appealed to the SEC by the brokerage firm. So we don't know what uh, the ultimate decision here is, but if you are one of these registered reps, who is splitting fees with your wholly owned LLC, I strongly recommend that you read this case. And until the appeal is decided that you not do that, this is clearly something that the SEC and the staff believe is not correct. And FINRA is on the lookout for it following this decision. CFTC. Uh, before you, just before yes. you move on, there was, there was, yeah, there was a comment and a, a prior question. So I don't, didn't want to move on too far before mentioning it. So in reference to the USPTO, Peter writes, it's my observation that in the world of technology, the very large companies are gaining more and more leverage. For example, the IPR review process where there is a court set up, which often is made up of retired executives from big tech companies. So just wanted to give you a chance to comment on that. Um, for that one, I'm going to defer to Evan. <laughs> Sure. Uh, the the IPR process has, in large, uh, in many cases, caused some what small or medium sized patentees would cause delays as people challenging patents have multiple forums in which they can challenge them. In other words, what a lot of people don't realize is that a patent is presumed valid when it issues, but that's a presumption, not a conclusion. So. Uh, those who are being accused of violating the patent can challenge the patent as having been improperly granted because it is not novel, because it's, uh, it's not non-obvious, there was certain prior art that was withheld and so forth. So uh, when the patent owner does go to court or threatens uh, alleged infringers, those companies are now increasingly uh, having the PTO sort of have a contested proceeding within the PTO, which can slow things down and some people perhaps understandably can say that maybe that does favor the big companies uh, who are accused of violating patents because as we all know uh, when you're accused of something when you're a defendant uh, the three things you do are delay delay and delay and drag things out as long as possible so uh, there may be a more than a kernel of truth that the uh, the ipr procedure is giving larger defendants the chance to uh, to drag things out in multiple bites at defeating uh, at defeating the patent and for those of you who um, are interested in the interplay of intellectual property and investment management, uh, traditionally the um, Troutman Pepper Investment Management Roundtable, uh, which is a once a month event, does a um, intellectual property program, usually in the spring, um, 
So check our website, and if you want to have a more in-depth discussion, happy to uh, have you join us. Uh, Karen, you also said there was a question. There was a question on a couple of sections back. Um, this was uh, from Wendy. Can you please clarify the statement that a 779 or AP cannot be a finder, as well as discuss best practices for placement agents raising capital for startup operating companies? Yes, um, a 7 or 79 cannot be a finder outside the scope of their registered broker dealer. That's called selling away, and it's probably, after embezzlement, the most important issue that the uh, S FINRA and the SEC will fine you over. And the reason for that is once you have a license and you're associated with a registered broker dealer, they want that registered broker dealer to supervise your activities if it involves the sale of a security, especially if there is transaction-based compensation. There's actually a rule on that, 3280, that says um, if the sale of a security is involved, then the broker dealer must run the transaction through its books and records, must record the transaction on its books and records, must be the party to the contract, must receive the fees. Now, the broker dealer can immediately turn around and pay that to the registered rep, but the point is the registered rep cannot act as a finder outside of the auspices of their broker dealer. That's just the law, that's the way it's always been, and this uh, exemptive order specifically states if you're an associated person of a broker dealer the transactions continue to need to be run through the broker dealer so so greg would this be similar uh, the sec proposed rule that says if you're a registered rep you cannot use the, the proposed finder exclusion or exemption is this somewhat similar conceptually perhaps to i think the issuer exemption that also says if you're a registered rep you cannot use the issuer exemption uh safe harbor as well that is correct. The issuer's exemption uh, under the 1934 Act specifically states that you cannot use it and you are not eligible to use it if you are a registered rep of a broker dealer. And that registration is active and for a period of two years following its inactivity. So if, if, if you want to become an executive, for example, of an issuer, and be involved in the sale of securities, and you're no longer associated with a broker dealer, you can't be involved and rely on the issuer's exemption, uh, which is a safe harbor for two years until your, your license is no longer um, re resuscitatable um, by association with a broker dealer. So now, that, yes, that is a non-exclusive, that it is a non-exclusive safe harbor. So if you become the CEO of a company uh, after having been a registered rep at a broker dealer and you're doing a hundred different things as CEO and one of which is helping out on fundraising, you'd probably be okay. It would be, a, I guess, a facts and circumstances test, but you would not have the safe harbor to rely on. You'd have to go to facts and circumstances, I guess. That is correct. And, and again, I, I think the fact pattern you laid out is one where um, whose ox is being gored if the CEO who's running a business also talks to investors about raising capital in the context of his business, he's not acting in an agency capacity, right? And he's probably not receiving transaction-based compensation. He's receiving um, you know, a bonus based upon the success of the business. So under the proposal, um, to, to answer the question directly, a registered rep of a broker-dealer will not be able to be a finder. Um, and receive his or her commission or fee outside of his relationship or her relationship with their broker-dealer. The broker-dealer will still need to supervise, and whatever financial relationship you have with that broker-dealer, that's still going to apply. They're going to take whatever piece of the fee that you earn that they uh, currently take under their arrangement with you. So the okay, CFTC... I know we're running a little bit um, short on time. So I know we have a fundraising discussion left to be discussed too. We'll probably um, hold all the rest of the questions till the end and see if anybody would like to stay on a little bit longer. Um, otherwise we can make sure we get your questions answered directly um, post webinar. So I'll let you. Okay, thanks Karen. Um, very quickly, the CFTC um, announced its enforcement priorities in um, a new manual that was issued in May of 2020. And basically, if you look at the list that's, that's shown here, uh, the types of prohibited conduct subject to investigation and enforcement, fraud, 
false statements to the CFTC, price manipulation, use of manipulation or deceptive devices, misappropriation of material, confidential and non-public information, and disruptive trading practices. The um, Dodd-Frank Act, again, this is back in 2008, for the first time ever gave the CFTC an enforcement power similar to Rule 12b-1. And, or, and that, I think, is uh, what we are seeing here is a manifestation of the rules applicable to the um, to those arrangements. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, a further list of the of what they're going after: fraudulent trade, trade practice violations, false reporting, and, and of course, undercapitalization of the brokers. Fund expenses. Um, the SEC continues to focus on fund expenses. The upshot here is if your PPM and or your operating agreement or limited partnership agreement lay out what expenses you're going to charge to a fund or to a company versus what is going to be paid by a manager or some other person, you better stick to it and don't try to slide one by because they are focused on this and it is a huge issue. The findings in Rialto, the matter concerned the manner in which Rialto allocated certain costs and expenses for third-party tasks for two real estate private equity funds, asset level due diligence, accounting value, valuations, and similar services. From 2012 to 2017, the SEC found that Rialto had misallocated to fund one and one two $3 million that should have been allocated to co-investment vehicles. Now, co-investment vehicles are sidecars, add-on cars, side investments, however you want to describe them, often needed because the fund doesn't want to invest uh, as much money in a particular portfolio company, but nevertheless needs the additional amounts in order to make the deal successful. And so they go to their investors and ask if the investors want to double down and make an investment through a co-investment vehicle. Or oftentimes the co-investment vehicle holds the investment of the fund managers uh, or other promoters. The, in this case, the um, manager allocated all of the expenses of due diligence, accounting valuations, and similar services to the funds. And so the co-investment vehicles were getting higher returns. The um, manager did have a limited partner advisor committee, the cost of which, um, and, and they did tell the LPAC that the costs were at or below charges that third parties would charge. They did a survey, but the last time they did that was in 2012 and not thereafter. And so they were relying on five-year-old data and they were charging one client account more than another client. And basically, the SEC found violations of the Advisors Act sections 2062 and 2064, which I had mentioned before. These are very powerful tools for the regulator. If you're not familiar with them, you should read them. This is the statutory reference, all of section 206. And the important thing to keep in mind is the SEC takes a position that all advisors, even those who have not yet been required to register with the SEC, are subject to the prophylactic provisions and penalties of Section 206. And so, uh, again, uh, you should be very familiar with the, what those rules are and how they work. So, um, in this particular case, the SEC said 2062 of the Advisor Act prohibits investment advisors from directly or indirectly engaging in any transaction, practice, or course of business which operates as a fraud or deceit. A violation of 2062 may rest on a finding of simple negligence. Scienter, meaning an intent to commit fraud, is not required. And similarly, 2064, the red, a showing of negligence is sufficient to establish a violation of 2064, the Advisors Act, and Rule 2064-8 there under. So there is no requirement of intent. It is simply a matter of negligence. So inattention to detail or Better to embrace regulation is one of those instances where you can have a 206 violation. Rialto was censured. They promised to cease and desist. They had to pay back the $3 million. And they also received a non-tax deductible $350,000 fine. So 
Our last topic with about uh, six minutes to go is raising capital in a pandemic. Um, the important thing to keep in mind here is all applicable limitations still apply. If you're a fund, 3C1 and 3C7 have a definitional barrier. You cannot engage in a general solicitation, except in a 506 uh, 506C rather, where under the JOBS Act, there is an exception built in to the general solicitation limitation. What this means is what is a public offering under Section 4A of the Securities Act of 1933 is once again in play. Have you invoked the safe harbor of Regulation D? Who are friends and family or those people that you know enough information about so that in the event that there is a loss in the investment that um, you will not cause a change in their lifestyle? And then, you know, the Ralston Purina standard is still the standard for whether or not a securities offering is a general solicitation. Using a placement agent doesn't change the landscape. The placement agents are still subject, even registered broker-dealer placement agents are still subject to one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, the placement agent cannot change the definitional barrier, is still subject to whether or not they as agent are causing the principal to be engaged in a public offering. Um, you still want to invoke the, the safe harbor of Regulation D by filing with the appropriate authorities. You still are now subject to quote unquote friends and family, but now you include the broker dealers, friends and family, um, some of whom have very significant Rolodexes and the standards in the Ralston Purina still apply. So one of the things, one of the tools that are available is the Jobs Act offering under 506C. Uh, you still have to file Form D to invoke it and you can offer to anyone but can only accept subscriptions from verified accredited investors. The issue with 506C, for example, and the new finder's proposal is you could not be a finder in a 506C, at least not as it's currently envisioned. Um, we've seen a lot of pushback with respect to the verification requirement for accredited investors Keep in mind that if you're a hedge fund or a private equity fund and you have a performance fee or a back end profit share, um, the investor must be a qualified client. And so they already have to meet the dollar tests. It becomes the question of verification. A blast email is allowed under 506C, which allows for leapfrogging gatekeepers and educating the consumer. But I'm now I'm going to call on Evan for some practical observations about whether or not leapfrogging may not be enough. Evan? Yeah, thanks, Greg. I mean, it's it's been an extraordinary uh, six or seven months in the fundraising space, uh, having you know been fundraising for about 15 years, including through the 08 crisis. We've obviously never seen anything like what's happened, you know, due to the COVID coronavirus pandemic. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, March, April, and most of May were clearly uh, nothing going on. Uh, Funds, investors, everybody was trying to figure out how and to buy groceries, what an N95 mask is, can their kids go to school, and just generally what's going on in the world and trying to make heads or tails out of it. Uh, however, that said, uh, June, July, August, September, things have changed dramatically. Uh, investors, uh, we speak to a lot of them, have been saying, you know, we can't sit on the sidelines forever. You know, if uh, this were a hurricane that came through and a month later we're back to business, sure, let's just wait a month and figure things out. But uh, Given the length of time that Corona and COVID are dragging out, investors are absolutely uh, continuing to allocate. Everyone has become an expert on Zoom and WebEx. And while it is certainly not business and fundraising as usual, uh, allocators are allocating uh, to funds and investor and, and management teams where they haven't met the entire team in person yet, which is, of course, so extraordinary. Are you seeing a change in the way due diligence happens? Well, sure. Uh, by necessity, it used to be, you know, due diligence was phone call, phone call, conference call, meeting, and ODD, and on-site, and we go through every piece of paper in your office or something like that. Given the nature of the pandemic, it has become virtually online, uh, OD, virtual uh, ODD online with virtual data rooms, uh, and pretty much almost everything being done uh, online at this point. Uh, you know, one critical thing, though, is this, you know, if you said to allocators a year ago, you'd invest with someone you never met before, they say you're crazy, we would never do it, and nobody ever would. 
Uh, however, the investments that are getting done now, and there's more and more of them, at least typically they've met someone on the team. So it's critical if you're a company or you're a fund and you're trying to raise capital in the pandemic, make sure that you, uh, someone on your team, your internal fundraiser, your external fundraiser, at least is on board because while investors are allocating during the pandemic and they may not have met the whole team, all four or five or 10 people, they've met at least one or two in the past. So if you're a company or a fund trying to raise capital and none of you has ever met an investor before, you know, all the 506 C's and email blasts in the world are not going to help because investors get thousands of pitches and the best kept secret or the worst kept secret is they can't read them. And if they get them from people they don't know, you got a very slim chance of getting them even opened, much less getting a meeting with them. All right. So I see we're at the top of the hour. Um, Karen, did we have any questions we could quickly address? We had a few and, um, Sanjay, if you're, if you're listening, you can feel free to type yours into the Q&A as well. I see that your hand is raised there. Um, Caroline um, asks, do we anticipate that broker agents slash registered reps will be able to split fees with finders uh, post the pending SEC decision around January? Um, the adopting release is silent on that point. Um, I believe what they're assuming is that this is a bilateral relationship between the finder and the issuer. And so I would assume what would happen is the issuer, if they want to use finders, and they're also going to be using a broker dealer, will be saying to the broker, we need you to, um, uh, you know, allow us to reduce the fee we pay you to the extent that we have to pay a finder. But a there is nothing envisioned where a finder could essentially hand off something to a broker rep who would then get the fee and then the broker rep would turn around and split something with the finder. No, that is not part of this proposal. And as we saw in the silver leaf enforcement action is specifically prohibited by the SEC and FINRA. Okay. Um, there is another question. Um, if RIA pays a share of the management fees to registered broker dealer and stated in the form ADV and in the PPM, is this suffice the legal requirement? Well, if the RIA is paying it to a registered broker dealer, then that is perfectly legitimate um, as a finder's payment because you know that's that's the archetypical proper way to do this. The RIA is paying its either share of management fee or share of its carry to the broker dealer, which then splits it with the registered rep under whatever arrangements they have in place. Um, so that perfectly is okay. I mean, did I misunderstand the question? But I, I don't I see a follow up. So, okay. okay. Oh, great. Um, and then another. Um, question, it didn't sound like the proposed changes to the finder's exemptions would provide any safe harbor to private equity fund managers taking fees in connection with acquiring portfolio companies. Is that your analysis as well? Yes, that is my analysis as well. A, um, the issue you have as a private equity fund manager uh, doing what you just described is the uh, essence of the Black Street um, enforcement action from a few years ago and if you want to contact me afterwards i can i can share that with you but in that case the sec went after a manager who had disclosed the fee arrangement had said that the portfolio company was going to pay fees to the manager for uh, selling interest in the portfolio companies of the fund and the sec came in and said no because the manager and its um employees were not licensed broker dealers, they could not take the fee and they had to return it. And uh, I am not aware of the finder's exception changing that, um, that landscape. In, in essence, what would happen is the individuals would need to enter into written contracts with the portfolio company, assuming the proposal is approved, with the portfolio company, and then the portfolio company would pay the individuals, not the manager. But right. again, it's just a proposal and current law does not allow that. Look at the Black Street Enforcement Act. 
Yeah, Greg, what you're saying is that the, the proposed finder uh, exemption, the SEC proposed exemption, expressly says it only applies to individuals, that is people, men and women, people, not fund managers, which are typically LLCs or some kind of entity, correct? That is correct. And the reason for that, and again, they didn't say it, but I could surmise the reason is a brokerage license is unique to the entity, not to the individual. So unlike a liquor license in many states where a you know, the liquor license can run with the land. Broker, lo broker licenses run with the entity, not with the people. And so if you, an, an entity under these proposals cannot be a finder, it has to be a natural person. And effectively, uh, if the portfolio manager is an entity, then it's precluded. It cannot enter into a finder arrangement, but an individual presumably can, now, you have all kind of other issues with that that I think you would want to disclose and probably have your, your limited partner um, advisory committee not acting in an advisory capacity, but acting in a governing capacity approve on behalf of the other limited partners, because I do think that that's a conflict of interest that uh, you want to be very comfortable is rock solid, and that isn't going to be subject to attack by some disgruntled investor. Because remember, all of this stuff only comes up um, when an investor gets annoyed and believes that they should have either been paid more or that someone else took too much in a fee or whatever. And so their remedy is to undo the transaction. It becomes effectively a regulatory put. So if everybody's happy, prices go up, there's no issue, the put's never exercised. But if you know, someone feels disgruntled, then the first thing that um, plaintiff lawyers do in a trying to attack a securities transaction is ask, how did they find out about it? And is, did somebody have his or her hand in the till with a fee? And was that person licensed? And if they weren't, that gives them the avenue that's necessary, the vector that's necessary to attack the transaction and get it rescinded and get the investor's money back. Okay, um, you'll let me know when you have, uh, if, if time runs out for all of you, there's a couple more questions coming in still. Um, how do I successfully recruit and retain a placement agent? Well, first of all, you want to, um, word of mouth is very good in this regard because if you know other investment managers who are, uh, been, who have been successful in raising capital, um, you want to know who they used. You want to use broker check to make sure that the person that you are talking to is licensed as a registered rep of a broker dealer. And then you want to go to that registered reps firm and speak to either the chief compliance officer or the or a principal of series 24 and say, I'd like to recruit your firm and in particular, Mr. Smith to be my um, private placement agent. Uh, but I think, you know, someone, and maybe Evan, you can put bits in here uh, since you are a placement agent. Um, yeah, Greg, those, those are all great, great points. The, the one thing I would add to it, which is uh, equally critical and everything you said is right, is a question of fit and specialty. Uh, many placement agents specialize in one type of investment or another. Uh, some do hedge funds, some do private equity funds, some do mutual funds. And some have more relationships with certain types of investors, family offices, endowments, pensions, and so forth. So to give a quick example, uh, if you are trying to raise money for your biotech company or your hedge fund, you want to find a placement agent that has extensive experience with biotech or hedge funds and knows investors that allocate to those. And the size of your company or fund may be critical too. So if you are at an emerging venture capital firm, an emerging hedge fund, you want to make sure the placement agent has relationships with, say, maybe the 10 or 15 percent of institutional investors and family offices that allocate to emerging managers. So you want to make sure there's a fit between what you do, how large or small you are, and the placement firm that you are bringing on board. That, that's absolutely critical. So if it's a mismatch, it's a waste of everyone's time. Yeah, and the other important thing to keep in mind, um, you know, I, I was watching um, uh, a, a 
television show the other day and every ad, every ad was for uh, a pharmaceutical from a drug company. And the only way I could ever access those pharmaceuticals was with my doctor. Now, you'll hear from some people, oh, they're doing that because they want you to be aware that you could be maimed and die and blah, blah, blah. Well, as a lawyer, I'll tell you that that type of disclosure would never be effective. So ask yourself, why are pharmaceutical companies spending millions of dollars um, with respect to drugs that can only be prescribed by a physician? And the answer is, you know, what's in red here, they're leapfrogging the gatekeeper and educating the consumer. They're saying to you, the consumer, you've got back pain. Well, here's a drug that may work. When you go talk to your doctor, ask him about this drug. And so you become the inside salesman uh, with the doctor. Now, the doctor, when he gets that request from you, has two choices. He can say, no, that's not an appropriate drug for you. Try this. You know, take a, take a hot bath and an aspirin and call me in the morning. Or if it's not going to hurt you and it's not contraindicated, he may prescribe the drug. And if it works, then you as the patient say, hey, doc, how about the fact that, you know, I know more than you. And he laughs and everybody's happy. And if it doesn't work, he says, well, I didn't know. I didn't think it would hurt you, but, you know, I wasn't sure if it would help. We gave it a try. It didn't work. So now let's go back to the old tried and true remedies. It's almost a no lose situation for the doctor, assuming it's not contraindicated to make that prescription. But if you as the patient didn't ask for that, then you would be in a position of not um, or, or the drug companies would not be able to get their word out because it's limitations that have been placed on pharmaceutical sales reps and other activities. So, and Greg, it's, it's, it's very analogous to you know, if a fund is raising money for their fund, a lot of the big institutional investors have, you know, so-called gatekeepers and advisors, you know, the NEPCs, the Wilshires of the world. So it's always a great practice if you're a fund trying to raise money from big investors to not only pitch your fund to the gatekeepers, the Wilshires, the NEPCs of the world, but also to pitch them to the, uh, the investors, kind of like your consumer in, in the drug example, because if the endowments and foundations say, hey, this looks like a great fund, and they go to their gatekeeper, you've got a much better chance of getting an allocation than if you solely went to the gatekeeper and did not also uh, uh, target, as you kind of said, the, uh, the underlying customer, the endowment, the foundation, or the pension. But the problem with that strategy is unless you have a relationship with that person, you're going to have to send first an introductory email, and then you're going to have to wait 30 days under a 506B before you can contact them again. On the oh, other yeah. hand, if, you do, if you're doing a 506C, you can blast out to anybody and immediately speak to them without any issue. So yeah, Absolutely. That, no, no question. I'm assuming everyone's got relationships going well beyond 30 days, more like you know, five or 10 years. And one last thing before we close, I just wanted to give some good news. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say anything good comes out of a pandemic, certainly, but at least at this point in October and September and August and the fall, there have been an increasing, ever increasing amount of cap intro events that private companies and the bank's prime brokerage groups are doing. So there is literally uh, either every other week or every month, large cap intro events where funds can access and present to hundreds of institutional investors and family offices because everybody is now an expert on Zoom and WebEx. So it is no longer the notion that everyone's got to hop on a plane and go to Florida in February to meet, but they can actually do it all online. So whereas March and April and May was almost zero activity, there's been a huge hockey stick as everybody is now uh, going online. And the last point I'll make is if you are one of those managers that uh, really performs well, uh, and you may be able to shine in 2020 because of the volatility. You know, the last couple of years, it's been sort of straight up and everybody can throw darts and look like a great manager. But if you are one of those managers who really navigated the, the choppy waters of 2020 well, you are now going to stand out even more. So, you know, there is some, some good coming out of all this. Karen, I think um, we're 15 minutes over and we've obviously... Uh, it had our uh, investors, in, or not investors, but our uh, audience indulge us uh, for longer than anticipated. Thank you for your attention. And certainly if you have any other questions that you'd like to follow up on, please feel free to reach out to Evan or me. Uh, our contact information is in the deck. And uh, any closing words, Karen? 
No, thank you both. You did an excellent job and thank you for all the participants that hung in there beyond the hour. Um, we will send a follow up note, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, connecting you with Evan and Greg, should you have any questions that did not get answered or anything else comes up um, as well as the deck for your review. This was recorded and will be posted to the FDA website. Troutman Pepper will also have a copy of this um, as well, Evan, if you'd like. And um, we thank you all for your time today. Thank you for your expertise. Okay, everybody. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be safe.